We're going to continue with uh, our series, a new series on um, praying. Paul says in Ephesians, I'm going to read it. It's my favorite section of scripture in the, in the New Testament. But we should be praying always with all prayer. All right, let me read this to you just to make this legal. This is Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against all those people who are so upsetting in our lives, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. And then there's a therefore. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day. Having done all, you stand in faith that God is going to do something. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So the issue we see here becomes the using of the spiritual rules and tools for one, for all the different types of outcomes and purposes. Now, I want to tell you, though the scripture says, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe you have it. So that word whatsoever. But I want you to know, I believe the Lord said that our desire should be the will of God. And the will of God it's not just some still voice speaking to you specifically. We're talking about the word of God that the Holy Spirit reveals to you according to what your particular purpose is. All of us work out our own salvation in fear and trembling before the Lord. But it's hard to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant, if you don't know what the heck you're supposed to be doing. Amen. So usually what we do is we take the all things we desire that we ask God, like some heavenly menu, we ask him to be the waiter to take our order and fulfill what we want in life so we can be happy. OK, what we want is for God to consider us dead to this life, but servants of the most high finding out what is it that he wants us to do. Now, God is not going to just lay it all out from A all the way to Z. What he wants us to do is literally moment to moment, let him unfail it because he doesn't show us the outcome. But when you get a word from the Lord on what he wants you to work on in your life, now you have to have the six, biblically, there's more than that, but we're going to talk with six primary things for us to develop strong faith because without faith is impossible to please God. The stronger our faith, the more we praise, we are able to please him. And we want to walk in the fact that we become a delight to the Lord. Amen. Instead of the Lord only being a delight to us because he's given us the lifestyle of the rich and famous. So what we want to do is look to the face of the Lord out of relationship to find out what is it that he wants us to do to serve him that he might be glorified. So since we're commanded that we should pray always with all prayer, based on what God wants you to do, we employ a certain type of prayer because of a certain kind of opportunity, purpose, outcome that glorifies God and brings us closer to hearing, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Amen. So we're going to go, we're going to talk about the, there are six important types of, of revealed in scripture at least six that I know of. And certainly God intended for each of us to pray effectively in different functional purposes. Jesus said, thy will be done. 
He tells him what he wants. Let this cup pass from me. But he yields himself. So it's fair for us to say, God, I really don't want to do this, but thy will be done. Because we're after serving the Father that he might be glorified and then we'll be glorified with him. What a deal. Okay. So we went through the sixth one, and each week I, I, I'll try to get as many of them or as long as it takes to do the six. So we, today we'll be talking uh, the prayer of agreement, then the prayer of faith. The, fair of, the, the prayer of faith is necessary in the prayer of agreement. Okay. Now, remember that the prayer of consecration or dedication is sometimes called the prayer of praise and worship. We should enter into the kingdom with, with praise and worship. You really can't worship God if you don't come in with a gratitude for what he's done for you. Okay. So the, then the prayer of intercession and the prayer of binding and loosing. If you were in the service last week, I touched on it lightly, but at the believer service, we went deeply. I might even bring that into the conference because a lot of ministers fight the people more than they fight the, 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 the devil. So we want to talk about the prayer of agreement today. In Matthew 18, 19, Jesus introduces this and he says, Again, I say to you, now in time you see truly, truly, verily, verily, and again I say, you got to pay attention to that because the Lord does not just run his mouth. He wants you to know that this is important. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree, now why would that? Well, because God wants us to know you're not an entity unto yourself. You are part of the body of Christ. And another thing is when you have another person involved in your life, you kind of watch yourself. And on the other hand, it causes you to humble yourself because you need another person in your life to be able to progress. OK, we love to be lone rangers for the Lord, you know, but you can't do that. OK, so again, I say to you that if. Two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask. It will be done for them by my father. That should be a capital F. By my father. Where? All right. Let's everybody say it, it, it's going to be answered. But it's in heaven. How long it's going to be in heaven? I don't know. But remember, God said. Anything that you agree on, that's touching any one thing, if you come into agreement and you ask the Father in my name, he will do it for you. But temporarily or how long, I don't know, it is done. But it may not be now. Now, where is faith? Okay, now let's talk about God. God had no beginning and he has no ending. God does not have a calendar that he doesn't have a stopwatch. He doesn't have to sign in. He had no beginning. He has no end, which means he has no past and he has no future. He only lives in now. It's ever present now. He expects us to relate to him in ever present now because faith is when now. But usually we draw off our past to judge the possibility of our future. And we really can't enjoy now because we either are focusing on what we didn't get and lost in the past and what we dread we're going to lose in the future. And we don't abide in the now so that if I go to uh, the fried chicken place down the street, which I avoid because... I really mess up the place when I go in there. But when if I go and I say I want two pieces of uh, dark and I want it spicy and I want it with red beans and coleslaw, when I make that order, I don't want to stand there and wait and wait and wait. When do I want it? Now. OK, now, if God says if two of you can agree and you ask the Father in my name, he'll do it. And he will do it in heaven, in his now, 
and he expects me to believe that it's done now, but I'm looking at the fact, but when? He said, I said now. Why? Well, if I had it in my hand, there's no faith and trust. God is going to forever, moment to moment, try to cause us to please him by causing us to have to use our faith to trust him when we don't have it in our hand. I don't know who clapped, but thank you very much. <laughs> I'll give you that $5 I promised after the service. Okay. Now, look, we see that for the prayer of agreement to be answered, those involved must be in agreement if they're going to pray the prayer of agreement. The problem is the other person who has to be in agreement is a person like you, and you just never know what's really true. Right. You understand that? Okay. Now, how many people know most people are so allergic to rejection or being made fun of or discounted or thought less than, they'll fake it. Hey, yeah, you with me? Yeah. Yeah. Right. See, would you come in agreement with this? Sure, man, that's great. But you really never know if they're compromising with their own self because they want to seem that they, they, they want to, they want, you know, we want to be the same. And we don't want to be judged. We don't want to be misunderstood. Because you have to understand the person you're in agreement has the same problem you have. You're a human being with a fallen nature that's infected by the fear of rejection by a person at the expense of fearing God. Okay. Let me move on. See, obviously, you do not know what's really in that person's lower guacamole, no matter what that countenance is like. I'm not putting them down. I'm saying that's reality. Okay. So what another way is truly believing is that it's a, what that person is really thinking and where their heart is, it's a mystery to be discovered and I wrote, or discerned. Now, in 1492, Columbus discovered America even though he didn't know where it was. He stumbled upon it. He just knew something was out there until he finally got there. Is that right? Now, I'd rather not wait to discover what's in somebody's heart. I would rather discern it. Now, when Mike and Elaine first got saved and we learned about the kisses, we were together and we just thought that the gifts were on the table and whichever one you wanted, that's what you get. And in my ignorance, I don't know why, but I decided I wanted the gift of discernment. And the Lord must have wanted that for me because I didn't even know what I was asking. But the problem with the gift of discernment is sometimes you discern somebody's heart that you wish you wouldn't have found. And now all of a sudden now they seem like they're your best friend, but you, you, you know that the motive of their heart is not what you wanted to be. But you didn't have to discover it because now you just knew it, even though you don't want to believe it. You got that? See, discernment allows you to know more about a person than you wanted to know. Now, this is not criticism. This is a form of discovery because what you're looking for is not a best friend. You're looking for something of like precious faith. 
See, you don't, you don't have to really like the person. You're looking for agreement, not, not BFFs or whatever. They, I, I don't know. But, you know I, don't, I don't know. I, you know, best friend forever kind of thing. That's, that's not what you're looking for. You're looking for somebody who spiritually can agree on the will of God for your life. Because God's not going to let you to be the shiny one who can go in all the time by yourself. You don't need nobody else. Because most of us are kind of arrogant in our spirituality rather than being broken that we have the opportunity. And he's after a broken and contrite spirit, not some superhero who's spiritually wonderful that everybody needs to admire. Okay, so watch. Let me read it again. What another is truly believing is a mystery to be discovered or discerned. God will not answer your prayer for someone else against his true desire and his free will. So the fulfillment of the prayer or agreement depends on asking the person, what is it you specifically are agreeing with me for? I don't, I don't want you to just seek my approval that you're in agreement with me. Do you and I want the same thing? It is difficult to be in agreement, for example, in healing, because often healing means different things to different people in that particular moment. For example, somebody can say, would you go play for my, pray for my aunt, uh, Aunt Mary in the hospital. She's dying of cancer. So I go over there. Now, it doesn't ma matter how virgin my olive oil is and how King Jamesy my prayer is. If I lay hands on a lady and say, by his stripes you are healed, cancer, I command you, this woman will live and not die, when in her heart she's had enough and she just wants to go see Jesus. So she, thank you, Pastor Mike, for coming over here. I really appreciate you praying for me. But she's already got, she's waiting on reservations to go. Now, me laying hands on her and speaking it and using the name of Jesus is not going to change anything because in her heart, we don't have agreement. And her idea of healing is to be in, in heaven, Amen. not to get up and have to go back and worry about putting the trash out and, you know, clean the house and be Miss Wonderful again. For example, some people really don't want their husband to come back. You understand that? I'm taking a stand. That man's coming back. He's going to leave that tramp. Shut up. You don't, know, you don't know what you're talking about. But the person's in their heart. They're not going to say, oh, no, I don't want my marriage. No, people, people don't want to be misunderstood. Oh, Lord, please don't let me be misunderstood. Don't want to be criticized, made a thought of. People not showing all the cards of really what they want for their life. So it's difficult for you to come along like some champion of the cross and come into agreement with someone who really doesn't want what you want, but doesn't know how to express to you what specifically they want. Now, the problem with that is if you pray the prayer and it doesn't happen, the devil's going to come back and make you feel like you're, you don't have any faith. You missed out. You should have you did this and so on. Because the devil is our issue, not other people. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But what happens to us, we're so people cornerly, we're looking for other people to accept us where we are and approve of us. And so we try to do some spiritual things to get approval from somebody else who really just, it's like, it's like when we used to witness in the French Quarter. We go in the French Quarter and you can always find some Baptist uh, 
passed his son drunk in, on Bourbon Street trying to escape. And then, uh, the, unfortunately, you go up with Romans Road. They will say that prayer with you and repent to get you to leave them alone. Now, you feel good because you, you, you saved a backslider, but that person was really working you because they want to go back to drinking. Now, we're not talking about judgment. We're talking about discernment here. So the fact is the prayer of agreement has to be where you have some form of discernment on who it is that you're requiring to come in agreement with you then you must, in the natural man, clarify really what do they want. Or you really have broken agreement, and again, the enemy has seduced you into spoiling your prayer agreement with having somebody who doesn't have like precious faith. Now look at 2 Peter 1.1. To those who have obtained a like precious faith with us in the righteousness of our God and the Savior Jesus Christ. Now, we're not talking about just saved people. We're talking about people who want to go to the specifically the same place in the spirit that you want to go. We have people all the time. We invite the church. We need to be in church. And, oh, yes, I'll be there. I, I'm coming. But they don't come. Right. Why? They didn't want to tell me, no, I'm not going. Follow that? Okay, so if I say we're going somewhere for 2 o'clock and you say we're going for 2 o'clock, at 2 o'clock you need to be there. But they're not because in their heart they never were going there. Now, why am I going through all this? Because I've been through this with several people. You can't get the prayer of agreement if it's not in the heart of the person of like precious faith, because how, the scripture says in Amos, how can two walk together unless both of them decided we're going to the same place? Good. It's got to be an agreement of specifically what is the outcome of all of this. Now, I believe that the enemy... Because Ephesians used so many times about these different layers of demonic principalities, it's not the person, it's what spirit is influencing the person to con you to have broken agreement when you think you have agreement. Because he is king of being of disillusionment. So you have to have the spirit of discernment. But then for the fact that we are in the body, you clarify specifically, then allow your spirit to discern if this person is actually truly in link with what you want. How can two walk together if they are not in agreement? So Proverbs 14.10 I've used this so many times. It's different uh, translations. This is the clearest one uh, that I think that the heart knows its own bitterness. And no one else shares its joy, meaning how the heart rejoices in life. You can't know the joy of their heart. It's an inside personal job of their personhood. And you don't know the resentment or bitterness or prejudice that they really have because people don't show all their cards. This is why even the convicts say, I'm a good person. Well, I mean, you shot two to death, you know. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah but I'm not, a, I'm not a monster. And this is why everybody in prison is innocent. Because people really care about what other people, People think about them. So their window dress outside, but I'm telling you for the, 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 the clarity, there's a reason why when uh, Dorcas was dead and Jesus went to pray, he put most of the people out of the room. 
because they would have broken agreement because they weren't of like precious faith. When Jesus was really needed to pray, he left his disciples outside and he went away from them because he had to have, uh, he couldn't have broken, uh, uh, now the, a better word is disagreement. But you see, you got to watch out because the devil will influence somebody to make you think they're in agreement when they're not and you waste that, that, that movement. Now, you don't get mad at them because they can't, they can't, they can't help themselves if they're a person like you. <laughs> Come on, give me a shout in here, right? All right. So, so when you realize we're all of the broken nature, where the fear of man is greater on our worst day than the fear of God on our best day. We are incurably religious, meaning we care more about the immediate people in our life think about us than the eternal God who will judge us one day. And you wonder why I don't have a big church. All right. Now, when you recognize that everyone has secrets in their heart to feel better than they know they are, that when you come into agreement with a person, you have to discern if their agreement is sincere. All right, now watch 30,000 people willing to go to war. And the Lord said, nah, nah. Everybody that really has fear and you're worried about yourself, leave. And it got 300. Is that right? Okay, so, so God says, most of the time, people will agree with you until the war comes. then they seek to save themselves. It's not bad. It's just human nature. All right. Now raise that hand and say, in Jesus' name, I am going to continuously affirm my prayer request. Okay, now watch. I can't prove this. But after you sought someone to agree with, with you on something that God wants you to do, that on the very least, Jesus said he never leave you nor forsake you. He's with you always. So that's why in the presence is the fullness of joy and provision evermore. Because in your need that you can't really get connection with another person to do the same way, because they're counting the cost. They don't want to go to war. Is that right? So you have to roll it over on Jesus. Just roll it over on Jesus. Because he's the one that's in agreement with you. Because it was his word and promise in the first place. Amen. Problem is, he's so invisible. <laughs> Okay, so you got a season when you finally are bankrupt on how you're going to come into agreement, and then you choose to trust him. You can't see the countenance of his face, and he doesn't grab you and hold you. Why? Because we're back to step one. He wants us to trust him by faith when you can't grab anything, can't prove anything. Usually by that time, we change our prayer request. Remember the tailor? He, he was going to make a suit. He cut this, and then he looked at it, and he cut that. And the first thing you know, uh, uh, he, he had a pair of pants. And then next thing you know, he, 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 he had a, a tie. And he kept on it, and he wound up with a bow tie. <laughs> I said, so our prayers 
look like a tuxedo until we finally get down to where we possibly think this one might pass. This one might happen. Amen. Good. That is good. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now, what I'm saying is all this that I'm saying is to say, do not abort your own prayer. You must stand alone on that word and watch your mouth because you, like what I said, don't know all the secrets of your own heart, which is in link with the devil to sabotage your faith and trust. Jeremiah 17, 9, the human heart is deceitful above all. Now, when your heart is a bigger liar than the devil, think about it. The devil might not be with you always, but that lying thing is with you, 724. All right, now look at Mark eleven twenty three, 23, and of course it goes into 24, but we're just going to do 23 right now. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, any obstacle that's in the natural world, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt where in their heart, which is going to lie to you based on natural truth, but believes that all those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Okay, now here's our problem. We hear from heaven or we take a promise that God tells us to believe. We try to come into agreement with it. Your own heart is going to get you to dress it down to the bare bones so that it, you have faith in your mind that circumstantially this could happen because we believe the scripture in delusions 312, you know, anything that's possible that I can believe for, that's better than nothing at all. No, it's not delusions 312. It's, it's, it, it's hysterics. Uh, that's what it was. Okay. Now let's read this again. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, any circumstance that seems like it can't move, it, it won't move, that's blocking us for the, the spiritual manifestation, but doesn't doubt in their heart, but continues to believe what you believe for, you're asking for, you will have it. Now, let's go back. But that might mean in the now, not in your hand. We have trained ourselves to be, it has to be manifested before we really believe it, even though God says, if you believe it and ask for it, it's done, but it's in the Father, and where, since he doesn't have a clock and a calendar, but by faith, we can't call God a liar that he didn't give it to us. Anybody here can show me your salvation? Anybody here can show me your robe of righteousness? Anybody here can show me your spiritual inheritance? Anybody got a document that all your past sin and present sin and you haven't lived to go sin in your future, yet it's all cleansed? But that is in your now. And I can't take your, that now from you. Anybody here's name written in the Lamb Book of Life? Show it to me. Huh? Anybody here full with the Holy Ghost? Show it to me. Anybody here got Jesus present with you always? Show him to me. Look how much in the spirit you have that you know and cannot be talked out of Yet it's in your now, but you can't manifest it. Yet by faith, you embrace it and it keeps you going. Is that right? All right. Now, once we have believed, 
prayed that we must receive it, we must let every thought and desire and emotion and circumstance affirm it and rather than distract. Now, if, uh, oh, oh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we, we, Elaine and I both thought a runny nose and a little coughing and so on, and immediately we wouldn't say, oh, I'm getting sick. We go, by his stripes, we're healed. Now, if your nose keeps running, if you don't watch out, you start coming to agreement with your own diagnosis that, that you know, I, I still have this. And you back off of your promise. You start compromising your own victory. Where does it come out of? Your mouth. All right, now, where do the words come out of your mouth from? Your heart. So this is your heart lying to you that you're not healed. Why? Because it's believing the mountain of the natural circumstances. And so you kind of wave the white flag. And well, you know, this is going to run its course. I thought I was healed. But now I think it's getting worse. How you doing? Well, okay, except for this cold I've been having a couple of weeks. You see. So now out of the heart, the heart lies under the inspiration of the devil, and you are the one that starts discrediting your own faith. So once we have prayed, believing that we have received it, we must let every thought, this is 2 Corinthians 10, 5, cast down every thought and cast down every futile thought of the heart because the, the, you don't need a devil you're discrediting your own promise. So you begin to see yourself as having that prepare, that, that prayer already fulfilled, even though circumstantially you can't manifest it. But it's not about you manifesting it. It's about you agreeing with God on that promise. So even if you do not see it in the natural, you have faith that it is in the now. Thank God continuously for answering the prayer. This is the prayer of gratitude. It's important to understand that this is not a confession of the physical fact. Because if your nose is running and you're coughing, you can't lie and say, I'm not coughing. So we're not asking you to lie. We're asking you to continue to confess the promise that you're healed. In the natural, you do not have it. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, read that with me. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Okay, now let me, let me, let me go. We walk by faith and not by feelings, circumstances, taste, touch. Now, another way of saying it, I wrote this out. For we walk by faith in what God has already provided, not by the natural senses that deny that I don't have it. Remember that the spirit would co coexist with the natural, that the spirit world coexists with the natural world, and something can be completely real in the spiritual world, but you're oblivious to it in the natural. How many people know that there are angels here right now? You can't take that away from me. God has assigned angels. Now, but we can't, we can't see them. But the spiritual world is actually greater reality than the natural world, because the natural world is destined to pass away. The word of God will never pass away. So the word of God is more reality than anything else. You sitting with your honey on that seat right there is not as real as you seated in heavenly places in all authority. So it depends. What world would you like to... Validate. F 
fear does not exist in the spiritual world. But fear is pretty manifested in almost every human heart. So remember what we're doing here. We're trying to develop strong faith to please God. And the more we please God, the more we can be employed by him to set captives free and do the work of the kingdom. If not, we retreat and we're always internally trying to fix ourselves. If T.D. Jakes would have said that, the screaming would go on 15 more minutes. You know, it's all right. I'm Mike, I ain't T.D., so it's okay. Now, what I want us to do is to confess our prayer as a faith act, fact. Now, let me show you. Our fear becomes more of a physical fact than our faith. Why? Because we don't feel faith, we feel fear. So the five senses determine our reality greater than all the books of the Bible. Is that right? How many people have ever felt better with a blue sky and the sun shining than you do when it's drizzling and it's overcast and it's cold. We're sensitive to our environment because of what we see, taste, smell, hear, feel. Is that right? All right. It's like the little boy started screaming. He's going to eat me. He's going to eat me. The dog's going to eat me. And the dad said... The dog's not going to eat you. He says, well, he's tasting me. <laughs> our, re our reality becomes what we feel and see. And how, how, God's trying to get us to live with him in a world that has nothing to do with the natural senses because he has declared that as dead. Reckon yourself as dead to the natural, but alive to the spiritual world. Now, physical facts are based on the, the, the scientific evidence is based on our five senses, while faith facts are based on God's word alone. It has nothing to do with the natural senses. So what has God promised about our request? By praying daily, thank you, Father, I believe that my debts are paid or thank you, Lord. I believe I am healed so that you are hearing yourself quote and confess the word of God. Why? Because faith comes by hearing. Look at Romans 10, 17. You know it. Now, what happens is we live, the scripture says, like the unbelievers in the futility of our mind. Because we think thoughts based on the imagination and the feelings that our heart, which lies to us, presents. So we have anxiety and worry with vain imaginations and we seek to save ourselves. And we don't really want to go into a realm that we can't. There's, there's, by faith. You have to then trust in something that you have no tangible way to confirm and affirm. Now, it doesn't change that we're saved, but what changes is our effectiveness to be able to do the work of the kingdom and set captives free because we have no real credibility because we don't, we just live like all the Gentiles do. Now, I don't know if this is going to work or not, but I'm going to try it again. Let's talk about the difference between believing and knowing. I spend half my ministry talking about I'd rather use my knower than my believer because my believer is so fickle. 
I believe this until something happens and I don't believe that anymore. But you know her is a rock. Okay, now just immediate. How many people here believe you are listening to me teach God's word? Raise your hand. All right, now, I wrote, well, why would you believe something that you automatically know? Say, you know, you're looking at me. Well, believe it or not, your knower trumps your believer. All right? So if you can see it, hear it, feel it, touch it, you don't need to trust by faith. But what God wants is to present a situation where you can't see it, hear it, feel it, touch it. Because now you have pure faith and trust in a God you cannot see. Whereas stick your hand in my side and in my hands and then you believe it. Because Thomas represents the human heart. I'll believe it and know it after I can see it and feel it. Now, God does not provide, in my humble opinion, evidence, natural evidence beyond a shadow of a doubt because he wants you to have something you doubt so that you take a stand against it and use your faith to overcome your doubt. If he provided circumstantial evidence beyond rational doubt, we would never respond to him in faith and trust. So God always has to leave something out to cause you to make a decision that you're going to believe his word and his direction over what you can prove against him in your natural man. This is what Jesus did with Lazarus. He let him rot and stink. Now, he had to do that because the Jews believed after so many days, the spirit could go back into a person. But once they cankered and once they were, they were rotten, the spirit wouldn't go back in. So Jesus had to let him rot where his own family didn't want to roll a stone away. So that now they had something that they had to overcome their natural man to judge something. Now they had to believe God. Better than that, now they know he was God. We're always wanting God to answer that prayer right now so we don't have to stand in faith and trust with nothing. And God allows nothing to happen in the negative mountains to get bigger because he's not trying to penalize us. He's causing us to grow in faith, faith to faith and glory to glory. We're praying that all of that goes away. So we can please him only by faith as he is a faith God. He demands that we come to him in faith and not based on natural evidence or circumstances. All right. I wrote this. Our God will not force anyone to do anything or believe anything. You either believe him based on what you know, but he's not going to coerce you. He said, follow me. You want to follow me? I love you, but, you know, I'm not waiting for you either, and I'm not going to turn around and grab you by the arm. We're not going to have a discussion. You either follow me or you don't. There will always be something unproven so that we, by choice, can respond to him in faith. Now, I've had plenty of people, I give my testimony about when it would happen to me in the hospital and I had that death experience and uh, Elaine and M Melissa wouldn't believe the doctors and they overcame it and I'm still there. There have been people, well, you didn't really die. 
well, you know, you see, they, they'd rather believe the fact that, well, they thought you were dead. But you know, even though your heart wasn't beating and you had no brain waves and your heart and you, you weren't breathing that, you know, they just, they just said you were. You follow that? So you're always going to have something that somebody can detract from it because God's going to leave that because he doesn't want anybody coerced or manipulated. It's a choice to believe God or not. You ready? One and a two. I believe God. I believe God. Yeah. Okay, so the next time you get pressed and the devil is trying to take your faith from you, if you got to, get your butt up and do a little dance and sing that and so that you hear yourself affirming it, but don't open your mouth and buy your product back. So our physical brains have many functions. We tend to trust everything by the five senses in the natural world, bringing every thought into line with the spiritual prayer is not a simple task. <coughs> Second Corinthians, 10, I've had innumerable people in my counseling go, <coughs> I said, you have to take every thought into captivity. Ain't nobody can do that. Well, certainly you can. <laughs> you have more faith in your set that that can't be done than obeying the word of God. Yes. So get thou up my office. I'm going to get a cup of coffee because we ain't going nowhere because we have broken agreement. If you can't agree to scripture and you have a reason that nobody can do that, then you're saying, of course I can't do that because nobody can, even though the word said, take every thought into captivity. Amen. Come on. Okay, meaning's over. <laughs> now, our enemy, and if you don't know who that is, the devil, will stimulate you with every sense every step of the way so that you stay in touch with the natural world. James 4, 7 is very relevant. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Importantly, there is more to this verse. Therefore, submit yourself to God. You cannot have the devil flee from you if you don't resist him and you cannot resist him if you're not submitted to his lordship. Meaning he is ultimate boss. You do what he says. Now, if you believe you're submitted to his lordship, he'll never leave you or forsake you. He's with you. He has ministers, angels, and he gave his word. Nothing can harm you. But if you're taking the bait from the devil through fear, you're not, he's not your lord. Now, look, it's this woman all her life, she was afraid to fly. Oh, I have a fear of flying. I have a fear of flying. Well, finally, she had to go somewhere. She had to be there. So she nervously gets on a plane, and she's sitting there, and she's shaking. And the stewardess came down to find out, do you want coffee, tea, or orange juice? She's coming down. She says, man, listen, uh, how often do these jets crash? She says, only once. That's true. Now, how much comfort she got out of it, I have no idea. Okay. Now, you cannot comfort yourself around other people because, again, you don't know their true hearts. So you can't borrow from them. Borrow a cup of sugar if you want, but you can't borrow faith from that. Uh, I like the story about a man that went to the bank and he bumped it into a guy in the line. He realized they had been in a fraternity together and they had known each other all their lives and they hadn't seen each other. And this particular man uh, was, had been married 70 years to the same woman that he met in college. 
So he said, man, Doris is going to be glad to see you. Uh, 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 I mean, my wife is going to be glad to see you. And they come over, why don't we have dinner? So he goes home and he says, sweetheart, honey buns, my friend is coming over and I want you to fix something to eat for him. And so she says, okay. So the guy comes over and uh, 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 this is Walter and, and the wife says, yes. And he says, baby, heart of my life, my breath of life, that sweetheart. Would you, get, would you get him some coffee? And the little lady went in and she came back out. And a little later, he asked for something else. And he, it was sh my little shortcuts and my little angel face. And he went on and my baby girl, I love you so much and so on. And that went on uh, about an hour and a half. It just kept this sweet little things. And so the guy says, he says, man, y'all been married 70 years and you're so romantic Every word out of it is a little, little cutesy little loving thing about your wife. He said, man, you're so romantic. He said, well, listen, five years ago, I forgot her name, and I don't want her to find out. <laughs> oh, 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 okay. So you, you, just, you just never know what, you know, where people are. Okay. All right. Now, let's go back. Submitting, say with me, submitting precedes resisting. You can't resist the devil if you're not submitted. Based on how much you're submitted to Jesus Christ's presence and lordship and word will determine how easy it is for you to resist the devil and he will flee from you. So we must be fully submitted to Jesus' lordship. We read in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because the adversary, the devil, what? Walks about like a roaring, roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, I want you to understand, I believe this verse is significant because it reveals, number one, you have an adversary. Accept it and deal with it. And if he's an adversary, resist him. The second point is, he is not a roaring lion, but he wants you to believe he is. The third one is he cannot devour you unless you put an apple in your mouth and lay on the table. <laughs> and the next one is. If you are vigilant in submission to God, the adversary can't do you anything. Last word, we must constantly keep our guard up knowing that the devil cannot harm you without your cooperation. Your agreement can't be with fear, doubt, and the devil. It has to be you're in agreement with God's promises and his presence. Let's stand and give him a shout. Praise the Lord. If this message ministered to you and you'd like to give and sow into this ministry, you can do that a couple of ways. You can text WDF to the phone number of 45777. You can also give on our website at whitedove.org. Bless you.